Mm. Looks like another week everybody has survived. Um, hopefully the this kind of is making the snow melt a little bit nice and slow so it'll seep into the ground, but we'll see how that goes for the rest of the spring. I just ask that now that we just uh, close our minds, open our hearts, listen to what the Lord has to say to us today. And I'll close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for today and every day that you bless us with. Lord, we're grateful for the warmer weather. Um, we just pray that this moisture will seep into the ground so we have a mild fire season this year and a good farming season. We just ask that uh, you're with us all here today. We know that you are. And we just pray that other people who don't know you know that find out that you are with them all the time. We just ask that, uh, that we all absorb the message today and that uh, we just have a great day together of fellowship. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to pray real fast. I know my heart isn't in the right place again. <laughs> so, dear Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, for all of us here who have gathered to worship your name, just that you would help us lay everything else aside and focus entirely on you. Just that whatever stress or anxiety, any of that, just that we could lay it down and that you, through the Holy Spirit, could uh, help us just focus on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. If we could all stand, sing praise to the King. Mm -hmm.
be seated. It is good to be back with you once again. Thank you for the invitation to come and to speak. Always a great thrill. And uh, I'm really excited this morning because this may be a first for me. Somebody sitting on the front row. (laughs) (laughs) 
So it, that is great. So thank you. Many of you have prayed for my grandson and my daughter and her family, and I truly am very grateful for that. Um, Silas continues to improve somewhat from his surgery, um, but he has a cold of some sort now, and he's been congested, which is making things more difficult. And uh, so if God brings him and my daughter to you in prayer, um, just would really appreciate your praying for them. Uh, many of you know I actually live with them. They bought a house that has an in-law apartment, so I live downstairs. I have a very lovely apartment. And uh, Hannah came down the other night and pretty much in tears. And she's just, you know, it's been a struggle. It's been hard, the emotions and uh, the time and the effort. And uh, I'm not sure it's what they were ever expecting. And uh, so just, you know, if you remember them, thank you. I truly do appreciate that. It's a new year, and I hear you had a, a good man last week come and speak to you and a possible candidate. How exciting is that? Lots of things going on. And uh, so this morning I thought uh, I would take the Word of God and speak to you in a matter of prayer. A new year is before you, a new pastor lies before you, Lord willing, and uh, how's your prayer life? How do you pray? What's the content of your praying? Let me ask this. Who taught you how to pray? Think through that. Who taught you? Now, I'm imagining that many of you would say, well, nobody really taught me. You know, in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it says, after Jesus finished these things, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So it makes sense that somebody should have taught us to pray. I mean, in your Christian life, when was the last time you ever went to a seminar on how to pray? When's the last time you ever had a Sunday school class on how to pray? Now you think through that, and one of the first things that come to my mind is, well, who's going to teach that? Right? I mean, who's going to volunteer to say, I'll teach people how to pray? That's a big deal, isn't it? So this morning, I want to look at Psalm 25, and I want to give you a prayer for your new year. We're only 15 days into the new year, two weeks. And so if you would allow me this morning to give you a prayer to take with you through this new year. So in one small way, I want to teach you how to pray. Very small way because we're only going to be looking at this one psalm this morning. After I graduated from Bible college... And actually, while I was in Bible college, I was exposed to this book, Power Through Prayer, by E.M. Bounds. E.M. Bounds was a pastor in the mid-1800s. He was a chaplain for the Union Army in the Civil War. And so, you might look at a book like this and say, well, he really doesn't have anything to say. Very first chapter, listen to what E.M. Bounds says. We are constantly on a stretch, if not on a strain, to devise new methods, new plans, new organizations to advance the church and secure enlargement and efficiency for the gospel. This trend of the day is a tendency to lose sight of the man or sink the man in the plan or organization. God's plan is to make much of the man far more of him than of anything else. Men are God's method. The church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. Wow. hundred and some years ago, and you'd think he's writing about today. He goes on in the same chapter. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, 
not new organizations or more and novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use. Men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. As a young man of 24 years old, beginning my ministry, this book was instrumental to me. Now he goes on, and for the vast majority, the book deals with preachers in prayer. Oh, beloved, listen. As you think of a new year for community, where am I at here this morning? <laughs> I've been bouncing around. Kettle Falls Community Bible Fellowship. You know, you have this whole new year ahead of you. And beloved, I, I want to tell you, it's going to be structured by your prayer. And what God is seeking today are men and women mighty in prayer. And so I want to ask you, how's your prayer? What's the content of your prayer? I think we've gotten away from the content of prayer. Who taught you to pray? Go to the scriptures and study the prayers of the Bible. If you want to know where somewhere to go, go to the New Testament and go to the Apostle Paul and study his prayers. I want to tell you something. His prayers do not sound like the prayers in our churches today. I can tell you that right up front. And so we need to go to the scriptures to learn how to pray. So we come to Psalm 25 this morning. And what is the title to this psalm, folks? What's it say? Okay, but you'll find there in italics is the title. What's it say? A Psalm of David. That's the title. Now our human authors have put their version to some of these, but really the title is this. It is a Psalm of David. So we look at this. It's a Psalm of David. And we really don't know where this Psalm came from in David's life. As we read the psalm, we understand it's a hard time in David's life, wherever that was. And if you study David's life, you know he had a lot of hard times. And so we come to this. And so let me break it up a little bit for you this morning. Verses 1 through 3, David's regard for the Lord. Verse 1, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not, do not let my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. It's interesting as you begin looking at prayers, has anybody ever ta taught you the acrostic for prayers on the, on, based on the book of Acts? A-C-T-S. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, acts, adoration. Notice how David begins his psalm. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. David takes the variance on the Old Testament phrase, lift up our hands. Now we see that done today in various situations. Most of the time for us today, when you see people lifting of hands, it is in connection with what, class? With worship, with, with music, for the most part, with music. You know, stop and think about it, you know, as a preacher, how many times have I ever found somebody lifting up of hands during my preaching? Not very many. How many times have you seen in prayer services lifting up of hands? Maybe occasionally, but not very often. If you study the scriptures, especially the Old Testament, you will find that the lifting up of hands is often connected to praying. So in the Old Testament, which David is doing, he's talking about the lifting up of the soul taken from the lifting up of hands, and the purpose that they would do for lifting up of hands, typically like this or like this, 
typically the reason they would do that is they were coming before God and saying, God, there's nothing in my hands. I'm bringing my hands and showing there's nothing here. I have nothing to bring to you. I'm coming to you in submission. I'm coming to you in dependence. It was a visual way of the Old Testament believer coming and saying, Lord, I'm coming empty-handed. I'm not holding on to anything. I'm surrendering to you. That was the purpose. And notice what David does. He takes that and he says, oh, Lord, I lift up my soul. I bring my soul before you and and I lift it up as my hands. (coughs) There's nothing that I bring to you. My soul is empty. It is dependent on you. Coming in submission. And then notice what he says. Oh my God, in you I trust. Do you see the combination? David says... I come with my soul before you, and it's empty, so empty that I'm trusting you for everything. Oh, beloved, listen. When's the last time you and I ever began our prayers like this? Oh, Lord, I lift up my soul. I bring the very depth of my soul to you, and it has nothing to give to you. I come totally dependent on you, and because that, I trust you implicitly. I know sometimes my prayer is like this. I might not verbally say this, but it is like, Lord, I trust in you after I've done everything that I possibly could. Right? I trust in you, David says. It's adoration. He's coming. And then he says, in verse 2, do not let me be ashamed. Unfortunately, sometimes in our English translation, we use English words that really don't show or say what the author's writing. When you and I think of the word ashamed, we think maybe of embarrassed. But what David is saying here, he uses the word um, discouraged. Oh my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be disappointed. Do not let me be discouraged. Do not let me be let down. It's kind of the thought that David's asking here. He's beginning this prayer. Do not let me be disappointed. Oh God, I'm I'm bringing my soul to you. I'm trusting in you. Don't let me down. Don't let me be discouraged. You know, I look across this room this morning and I can guarantee we have people in here who recently have been discouraged, disappointed. And I think maybe sometimes in God. I've had over the years so many people say, Pastor, I've prayed to God and he never answered. I prayed to God and he let me down. David is kind of saying the same thing. I'm lifting my soul and you I'm trusting and I'm asking you, do not let me be discouraged or let down. Secondly, he says, do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let my enemies exalt. Man, if there was anybody in Scripture who had enemies, it was David, right? (laughs) Every time he turns around, he's got enemies around him. Do not let my enemies, notice, exalt over me. And again, I'm sure some of you here are sitting this morning, you have had some enemies. Might be a boss, might be a neighbor, might be a family member, some kind of an enemy who has exalted over you. Verse 3, indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. We could get into the theology of waiting, and that is not my purpose here this morning. If you're ever looking for a book to read, find the book. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's in print anymore. Waiting on God by Andrew Murray. 
It's kind of a devotional book. He has 31 chapters. And he takes 31 different passages in Scripture that talk about waiting on God. It is, along with E.M. Bounds, Waiting on God was a tremendous book for me as a young man. Look what David says. None of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Do you practice the art? Do you practice the virtue of waiting upon God? Or do you have to always be doing something? Now David's going to bring this in. Look down at verse 5. The last phrase of verse 5. For you I wait all the day. Verse 21. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Have you practiced the exercise of waiting upon God? I'm going to be honest. David starts out, and I find this stuff very hard. I find this personally very hard. For me to come and trust God implicitly, it's like, okay, God, if you'll just stand over here, let me try to do this, and if I'm not successful, then I trust you. That's how I work sometimes. To say, okay, God, uh, this is in your hands. I'm going to wait upon you. Okay, I'm done waiting. <laughs> right? It's like, I waited, but God didn't do anything, so I'm going to do something. Like Elijah. Instead of waiting on God, he took off and ran away from Jezebel. He goes down there to the mountain in the cave. And he stands out there, and God goes, Elijah, what in the world are you doing here? He didn't wait upon God. God never told him to move. God never told him to run. Sometimes my middle name is Wayne Elijah Morris. It's like, okay, I waited, but time's up and waiting upon God. David says, and he starts this, and we're going to look at it a little bit more. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be disappointed, discouraged, let down. Beloved, this morning, I want to tell you, Scripture says, Scripture is God's truth. And David says, none who wait for you will be disappointed. As you begin this new year, I'm giving you a guarantee. I'm giving you a fact from Scripture. If this is you, then this is what David says. You'll never, ever be let down. Yes, in our mind, we might think, well, it didn't go the way I thought. But God will never allow us to be ashamed. In verses 4 through 7, we find where David, in this prayer, in this psalm, he begins to ask some request of the Lord. David is seeking God's guidance and wisdom. I love this psalm because it is a psalm of humility. It is a psalm of, of dependence. Notice. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. Notice on your outline... Request number one, two, and three. Notice the ones I have underlined. Here is request. Make me, teach me, and lead me. As this new year begins and you become, become serious about your prayer life, and as you become serious about your request of God, here's three things. We ought to be praying, God, make me. God, teach me. God, lead me. And so what are we supposed to do? Notice request number one. Make me know your ways, O oh Lord. Make me know your ways. I don't know about you, but I want to do things my way. I like the way I do things. And David says, make me know your ways, O oh Lord. Did you know God has ways? Did you know God has ways to do things, ways to be? When's the last time you ever ask? Make me know your ways, O Lord. I have this whole new year ahead of me. Lord, make me know your ways. Help me to know how to live life, O Lord. Deuteronomy 32, verses 3 and 4. 
Make me know your ways, O Lord. Secondly, teach me your paths. If you study the scriptures, and again, especially in Old Testament, as you find the things about paths, usually they relate to our daily walk. When you're on a path, that's the way you go. I got a couple of pictures here. I'm not sure if we can show these at this time. Paths. This is in the Beartooth Mountains. Notice the big highway we were on. Four-lane highway here. That's a path. Make me know your paths. This is at about 9,000 feet. Narrow. I think I have another picture. Can you see that very well? That's no, pretty, pretty dark, isn't it? Sorry about that. Well, oh, not, not yet. Go back. There we go. We're talking about paths. Oh, yeah, that's a lot better. Thank you. We're talking about paths. This is a path that I was on, just out of paradise, and going up to Mount Rainier. And, you know, it's interesting about paths, because if you go up there, there's a lot of paths, and you can get kind of confused and turn around. But that's a path. And David is saying here, teach me your paths. Next slide. I think I have one more in this setting. That's my wife. And uh, that's the last kind of big hike that her and I were on. That's a path, Mount Rainier in the background. That was kind of a hard path to go on. Pinnacle Peak. Now, folks, listen. God's going to put you on a path. It, it might not always be easy. Sometimes those paths are hard. Sometimes the view is beautiful. But the trail and the path, it's hard to take. And David is saying this, teach me your paths. Are you willing to ask God that? Are you willing to say, Lord, I want to know your paths? I showed you, uh, no, I didn't, uh, paths over in Nepal, paths over in Togo. Years ago, I was over in Togo, West Africa. And I spent a month over there teaching and preaching. And it was so interesting when we got to northern Togo, really got out, I mean, in the bush, out in the boonies, and there's just a little two-track Jeep trail that the missionary and I were on, and we were going back in here. And it was just fascinating to see the, the plateau, kind of the jungles, and as we're driving along, you'd see these little paths coming through these fields. And we'd be going along, and all of a sudden there'd be this little village and a little church building, just a thatched rooftop and some benches. And we'd get there, and uh, the time would get closer and closer. And I'd look around, and I'd see these people coming out, all these paths to get to the church. Teach me your paths. Beloved, I want you to pray this. I want you to honestly ask God, Teach me your paths. And then thirdly, lead me. Lead me in your truth and teach me. Lead me. You better really be wanting God to do something in your life if you're going to ask this. Because if he's going to lead you, you don't know where he's going to take you. I think i got a couple more slides here. Lead me. Some climbers coming up. Do you notice anything about these climbers? They're dressed warmly. Yeah, there's a rope. They're all tied in together. That's so that if one falls, the other two are going to catch them. <laughs> the idea is... <laughs> To be roped in together. You know, I used to practice. Have an ice axe. We used to practice sliding. You'd fall over, turn over in your belly, put that ice axe in, no light yet. <laughs> and you'd practice that to rescue. Next slide. Again, nighttime. 
traveling, going up. Notice, we're all hooked in. We're all roped in together. There's somebody who's leading us. Somebody who knows the way. Somebody who's already gone before us. In Nepal, it's the Sherpas. They're the first one on the mountain. They go up and they place the stakes and the ropes. They make sure it's all hooked in. And then you have somebody leading you. And you hook into that rope. And off you go. I think I have one more slide. Do you see why you want to be roped in? <laughs> now, in certain parts, you're no longer roped in because you are at a point where it's useless. The other person is going to pull you right off that ridge. And so you go unclipped, but you do have somebody who's leading you. You want somebody who knows what they're doing. My last mountain that I climbed when I was over in Nepal, my leader, the man who led me, had climbed Mount Everest. I was in pretty good hands, I thought. Do you see? We can have the lights. Do you see what David is asking here? Lead me in your truth and teach me. Are you just going to go through 2023 and just go through life without asking God to lead you? Why would you do that? Why would you go through life who may be huge mountains? Who knows where God's going to take you? If you are asking God to take you on paths and you're asking God to lead you, who knows where he's going to take you? He does. But you don't. Beloved, listen. When you're asking God to lead you, it's really good to be roped in with some other people. I hope you have some godly, godly people that are walking through life with you and you are hooked in with them. There is a rope that is connecting you. In the biblical world, when God is leading you and you are roped in, hooked in with him, that rope is made up of those fine fibers of the scriptures and prayer and Christian brothers and sisters in Christ. And those are all woven together and the Lord is leading you. Are you really willing to ask these three requests? Make me, teach me, lead me. It's a prayer that David begins Look at this, verse 5. Lead me in your truth and teach me. Notice the reasons that he gives. Reason number one is, for you are the God of my salvation. That's why I'm asking you to make me know your ways and teach me your paths and lead me in your truth. Because you are the God of my salvation. You're the only one who can do this. I believe in you with all my heart. I've placed my faith in you. My life is in your hands. Lead me. Isn't it interesting how in our world we place our spiritual eternity in the hands of God and Jesus Christ? But when it comes to this earthly realm, for some reason we don't do that. It doesn't make sense, does it? I'm willing to put my eternal life in his hands, but I can't put my material life in his hands. I'd rather go through this world in my own, with my own ways. So he says here, the reason I'm doing this, the reason I'm asking you these things is because you are the God of my salvation. Look at the second reason. For you, I wait all the day. Wow. Make me know, teach me your paths, lead me in your truth, for I wait all the day. Are you willing to wait all the day? Are you willing to wait all the days? What if God says, I want you to wait a day, two days, a week, a month, a year? Wow. For you, 
Don't wait for anybody else. Wait for you all the days. Sometimes we exaggerate. Typically, I'm a very punctual person. I typically like being early. My wife, see, I can't say bad things because she's not here. My wife was not always as punctual as I was. Let's just put it that way. And sometimes I would exaggerate and I would say, I've been waiting for the last two hours. You know, and it's been five minutes or three minutes. Waiting, waiting on, waiting on. It's a good thing when you and I wait upon the Lord all the day. Lord, I'm asking you to show me your paths, your ways, teach me your truth, and I'm willing to sit here and wait till you do that. I'm not going to move until you show me, make me, lead me. I'll just wait. That's a good thing to wait. When I climbed, depending on where I was, a lot of times there were crevasses. And a crevasse basically is a just crack in the glacier. Sometimes you could step over it. Sometimes you could jump over it. And sometimes you would say, mm, nope, not that one. <laughs> and so when you have somebody leading you, Sometimes they would get up there and they'd get to the edge of this crevasse and you might be the second, third person. Sometimes we would have four and everybody would stop and say, so you're stopping, you're standing and you're looking up there and you're thinking, you know, what in the world's going on? They need a break, they need whatever. And uh, you know, it's like we've been sitting here for five minutes at 20,000 feet and breathing is hard and, and pretty soon we start going this way and we get up there and we find out the reason was we were waiting because the leader was trying to decide what step to take next. We can't go this way. And sometimes God does that with us. You're going through your year, you're going on your path, and we can't see the crevasse that lies ahead of us. And we're asking God, lead us, show us, teach us your paths. And we're waiting. And then finally God directs us and a little bit later on, we find out, oh, if I would have went this way, I would have fallen into that crevasse. Thank you, Lord, for leading me this way. Thank you for showing me your paths. Notice what he says here. Request number four, verse six. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindnesses. Notice they're plural. Remember, O Lord, Look at the reason. For they have been from of old. The word is eternity. For they have been from eternity. David is shifting gears. He's been pleading. He's asking these requests. And now he is coming before the Lord and he's saying, Remember, O Lord, your compassion, your mercy, and your loving kindnesses. That word loving kindnesses is a word that you and I would say, Remember your unfailing and unchanging love. Some people translate this, maybe in your Bible, it has covenant love. David is writing, he's asking God, remember your mercy and remember your covenant love, that unfailing and unchanging love in our relationship. David knew he needed that. And he's going and he's asking God to remember his character. Because they've been from eternity. Have you ever prayed and asked God for this? Think of the content of your prayer life. What does it sound like? Does it ever sound like this? Beloved, I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. 2023, go deeper in your prayer life. Go to biblical praying. There's nothing wrong with praying for our sicknesses and all those things is I'm asking you to pray for Silas. Those are important. But in our closet praying, those moments when you and I go to our sacred place and we get down on our knees and we begin asking God, oh Lord, I lift up my soul to you and I'm going to ask these things and Lord, I want you to remember 
your compassion. I want you to remember your loving kindnesses because they've been from eternity. While the things in my life are finite, they're here, they're there, they pass away. These are from eternity. And then notice verse 7. He says, do not remember. He goes from remembering, asking God to remember. Now he says, do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. <laughs> How fascinating that first of all, before David says this, he says, Lord, remember your mercy and your unfailing love. And then he says, don't remember my sins. I believe what David is saying is this. God will forget our sins when he remembers his eternal mercies and love. David understood that. Do not remember my sins or my transgressions. It's present tense. Notice in verse 7, according to your loving kindness, remember me. For your goodness sake, O oh Lord, remember me. Been there, done that? Right now, today, are you able to be able to say, do not remember the sins of my youth, past, or my transgressions, present, so according to your loving kindness, according to your unfailing and unchanging love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Not based on anything good that I've done, but for your goodness sake, remember me. Oh, you see the humility of David. In my mind, I would almost imagine David on his knees, which was a very familiar posture in the Old Testament. Remember for your goodness sake. Notice second on your outline. David's view. David's view, verses 8 through 15. Good and upright is the Lord. Very first thing that he says, it's a statement of fact. It's a declaration of faith. Good and upright is the Lord. He could have said justice and right our God. He disciplines, he punishes. He could have said that. He knows that. But in this view of David's, he says, good and upright notice, is, again, present tense, is the Lord. Therefore, even though the word therefore is stopped for us to see what it's there for, notice, therefore, he does three things. He instructs, he leads, and he teaches. He instructs, notice, the sinners, he leads the humble, and he teaches the humble. Notice, he instructs who? Sinners, how? In the way. Secondly, he leads who? The humble. How? In justice. Notice, he teaches who? The humble, where? His way. Is that you? As you look at God's view, good and upright is the Lord, therefore, here's what he's going to do. Do you base your life on this? 2023, are you going to go through life looking at this saying, good and upright is the Lord? He's good all the time, right? Yeah, wait till the bottom drops out of your life. Then are you say that? We should. Absolutely. All too often I hear people say, and they'll even use this, they'll quote that in good times. When life is going grand, we say, God is good. God is upright. Until it's not. And then somehow we find that we complain, we murmur, we mumble. But David, as we're going to find in just a moment, whose life had hit bottom, David who was struggling, he says in his view of God, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, because of that, he instructs, he leads, and he teaches. And oh, beloved, I want to encourage you this morning. This has not changed. Whatever you're going through, you ought to be able to say, good and upright is the Lord. Right now, in my life, it might be a mess. But God is good. He is upright. 
And it's all present. Notice the second view. Verse 10. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. Underline, circle, somehow mark the very first word, all. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth. If you go back up to verse 4 where David said, teach me your paths, now he is saying, all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness. I don't know where God's going to take you this year. I don't know what path or path he is going to have you on. Some may be smooth, some may be easy, some may take you down good places, and then he might take you to a different path. One that's hard, one that's uphill, one where you're carrying a heavy pack. I don't know. But notice and don't forget all the paths of the Lord are unfailing love, unchanging love, covenant love, and truth. Again, it is a statement of fact. It is a declaration of faith. Do you have that? Do you see that? Are you starting this year like that? Are you saying Whatever path, Lord, I'm on, I know it's because you love me. Whatever path you put me on, I know because it's truth. You're teaching me. Notice what he says next. To those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. It's conditional. It's qualified. All of these paths are to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Oh, he puts a qualification on it. For your name's sake, Oh, Lord, in verse 11, in this view, all of these paths are for those who keep his covenant in his testimony. And look at his petition in verse 11. For your name's sake, O oh Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Again, notice the present tense. Pardon my iniquity, for it is Great. Do it not for my sake, but do it, notice he says, for your name's sake, O Lord. I don't have time this morning, but if you were to go back to Isaiah 55, verse 7, Jeremiah 33, verse 8, talking about Isaiah says, for you will abundantly pardon. In your prayer life, do you pray like this? Do you come before God and say, God, I'm lifting up my soul before you, And I'm asking you, for your goodness sake, for your name's sake, to pardon my iniquity because it is great. Abundantly pardon that. Again, I think sometimes we have this mentality. Lord, I come before you and I'm lifting up my soul and I'm asking that you would put me on a good path today and because I'm really not that bad. My life really is going pretty good. Thank you very much for that. And... uh, Sometimes we never see ourselves as sinners. I think that's a big mistake. God has been gracious. He has forgiven us. He has saved us. But sometimes there's present tense of our sin. And we just don't like to admit it. And David is saying, pardon my iniquity. Now, If you read through this psalm, you're going to notice it's a major phrase here, a major theme. Remember back up in verse 7, do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. Now he's asking God to pardon my iniquity. And in just a moment in verse 18, look upon my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Again, as we think of praying for this year. Are we willing to do that? Do we understand where we are? What is our view through all of this? View number three. Verse 14. Skip right down. Verse 14. The secret or the counsel of the Lord is for those who fear him. Notice in all three of these views, the present tense, good and upright is the Lord All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness. Uh, The secret or the counsel of the Lord is, and again, notice the condition, for those who fear him. 
that's us. It ought to be us. Notice the result. And he will make them know his covenant. Again, notice the connection to verse 4. Make us know your ways. Here he says, he will make them know his covenant. Are you willing to say, Lord, make me know? (laughs) I'm not sure. I'm not sure I want to say to God, God, make me know. Because when I say that, who knows how God's going to do that? (laughs) All right, Wayne, you're really asking that? Yes, Lord, make me know. Now, for somebody like me, I'm hard-headed sometimes. All right, most of the time. (laughs) Sometimes, you know, I'm so stubborn. Sometimes my heart just, I'm going to do things my way. And when I get stuck or things go hard, then I go to God and say, okay, God, help me out here. Rather than being able to say, make me know And to be able to say, if if I'm asking God to do that, and I know he is going to do that if I ask him, who knows how he's going to do that? All right, I'll make you know, make my ways. Here he says, he will make them know his covenant. Notice the reason. Verse 15. My eyes are continually toward the Lord for, here's the reason, He will pluck my feet out of the net. He will bring my feet out of the net. The net in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms, is the snare of the devil. It's when you and I get trapped is what that net is. The the fowler's net, the bird's net. They would weave and put these things up between trees and the birds would fly into these things. Notice what he is saying here. I, I love this. My eyes are continually toward the Lord. I'm looking towards the Lord for, the reason I'm looking towards that is because He will pluck my feet out of the net. Notice David doesn't say, for He will keep me away from the net. He will direct my paths away from the net. David says, I know my feet are going to get in the net. And so when my eyes are continually toward the Lord, He will promise to pluck or to bring my feet out of the net. Oh, Lord, I need that. I want that. I need to keep my eyes on the net. When I climb, I always kept my eye on the persons up ahead of me. Because all of a sudden, if one was missing, I knew something was wrong. You'd learn that real quick. Are your eyes upon the Lord this morning? Don't be quick to answer. Are your eyes, like verse 15, my eyes are continually focused on the Lord, laser focused on the Lord. I almost brought one of my longbows with me this morning. That's what I shoot mostly. And I wanted to show you that it's really basically a stick and a string. And so when you shoot, you have to have laser focus on whatever it is, and you have to be so zeroed in on the smallest, minutest part that you can find to make that arrow hit there. I think that's what David is saying here. My eyes are continually laser focused. They never move. They never leave. I shoot as only good as I look. If I'm not laser focused, whoops, (laughs) it's over here, it's over there. But when you're laser focused, like I think what David is talking about here, my eyes are continually, they never leave, they're focused on the Lord. For he will pluck my feet out of the net. I don't want to sound like a Dave the Downer, but I just know that my feet are going to get caught in a net. I work hard that that doesn't happen and God, by God's grace to go along, but sometimes my focus is not continually on the Lord and I step in a net. But I know that when I do that, He's going to pluck me out. I know that when I fall into the crevasse and I'm roped up into the Lord, 
that when I fall, yeah, I'm just going to fall a little ways. But I know I'm not going to go very far because I'm hooked in and the Lord's going to pluck me out. Beloved, hey, listen. It's going to happen to you too. Keep your eyes where they belong on the Lord. Finally, verses 16 to 22. And in this, these few verses, we find David's plea, but we really find David's emotional state, why he's writing this psalm. On your outlines, let's see what I did. Yeah, look at your outline for a moment. Look at the words under these pleas that I put in bold. Lonely, afflicted, distresses, troubles, affliction, trouble, sins, enemies, hate, violent hate. And that was a good year. <laughs> Do you see where David's at? I want you to understand Psalm 25 is in this context. David is writing and here's where he is emotionally. Maybe some of you are there emotionally today. Or maybe you've been there recently. Or maybe in 2023, one of the paths and one of the ways that God is going to put you on is here. Look what he says. Look at these pleas. Number one, turn to me and be gracious to me. And then he goes through the reasons. So his main request that he's bringing, beginning with is turn to me and be gracious to me for I'm lonely and I'm afflicted. Oh man, been there, done that too, right? Some of you fit in that. Lonely. I can remember a period, I went through such a deep period of loneliness after my wife died. Uh, you know, I was like down in the bottom of the barrel and under the barrel and just, I was so lonely. And then the affliction started coming in and the doubts and all the things going through my mind and just, it was a bad time for me. You know, I wish I could stand here from you and just say, oh, I was just so, you know, I wasn't. And I can understand where David's going through this. Turn to me and be gracious, for I am lonely and I'm afflicted. God, I need your grace. Secondly, bring me out of my distresses. David is saying, I'm down in the crevasse. I'm down in the great big wide ditch of distresses. Bring me out. The reason for the troubles of my heart are enlarged. Wow. David's doing an autopsy here on himself. And he's taking his heart out. And he's looking at it. And he says, I'm asking to bring me out of my distresses because the troubles, look at my heart. I have an enlarged heart of troubles. Again, some of you, if we were to do an autopsy on your heart, I'm sure your heart would be enlarged because the troubles of your heart are enlarged. They're overwhelming, the troubles that you find. And sometimes we look around and we look at, oh, well, those don't look like big troubles. Well, maybe not to you, but to me, they're huge. This happened, this happened, this broke, this broke, my car won't start, all those kind of things. Just really the troubles just keep going on, coming, coming. Bring me out of my distresses. Plea three. Look upon my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. David is doing introspection here. He's looking at his life. He's looking at his heart. And he says, oh God, I'm a man of sin. I want to keep my eyes focused on you, but I fall into the net and forgive all my sins. Plea number four. Look upon my enemies. Now here's one I can get behind. <laughs> you know, okay, God, get my enemies. Look upon my enemies. The reason, for they are many and they hate me with violent hatred. Oh God, my enemies, they hate me. Strike them down. <laughs> you know, we get that revenge. But David just says, look upon my enemies. Look upon my enemies. Plea five, guard my soul and deliver me. Guard my soul and deliver me. 
If you were to go to Hebrews 13 and verse 17, and 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25, Peter says he's talking about the bishop and guardian of our souls, the Lord Jesus Christ. The guardian of our souls. I like that term. I realize that when I go into the paths, wherever they take me, I have a guardian of my soul. And David says, I lift up my soul. And I think he's got this all down. I lift up my soul to the guardian of my soul. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, he's talking about pastors who keep watch over your soul. Whatever man comes here, I think his number one priority, other than his relationship with Christ, is to watch over your soul. And now, David in this plea, guard my soul and deliver me. Deliver me. Deliver me. Verse six, or, uh, plea number six, verse 20. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let me be discouraged, disappointed, for I take refuge in you. I'm sharing this. I hope by now you've figured this out. I'm sharing this psalm because I want you to find yourself in this psalm. I want you to say, yes, I'm there. I'm here. This is what my life looks like. I want you to be able to say, don't let me be ashamed, for I take refuge in you. Don't let me be discouraged because I'm taking refuge in you. I don't want to find out that when I trust in you implicitly, it was all unworth, it was unworthy. Don't let that happen, Lord. Guard my soul, for I'm taking refuge in you. When the loneliness and the affliction and the distresses and the troubles and the sins and the hatred comes, take refuge in God. Find yourself fully under him. Plea number seven, verse 21. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me. Out of a lot of statements of David's, this is one I find really fascinating. Because when you and I talk about David, sometimes the first thing that comes up in our discussions about David is his sin with Bathsheba and all the things that went on and uh, his killing Uriah. And I mean, you know, you look at that and say, wow, talking about a guy really messed up. How can God use him? And then I find this. Look at that plea in verse 21. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me. I would know some people in my circles that I have lived in in the past who would say, David didn't have integrity. I wouldn't call him as my pastor. I wouldn't call him to teach a Bible study. He has no integrity. And yet here you find, he's saying, let integrity and uprightness preserve me. I love that because David is saying, I'm not defined by my past. Lord, you've forgiven my sins. I'm pleading. I'm asking all these things. Deliver me from all of this. And now let integrity and uprightness preserve me. Notice his reason. Here it is again. For I wait for you. When you study Psalm 25, did you notice? David begins his psalm and he ends his psalm with I wait for you. I hope and pray that um, 2023 for you will be a year where you learn how to live Psalm 25, but it will be a year where you wait upon God. Personally and as a church. Whether you have to wait shortly or long term for a pastor. Are you willing to say we're waiting upon the Lord? Notice his last plea. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. What a fantastic prayer. So what do we do with this psalm now? Some of you will take these notes, <coughs> fold them, put them away. If I were to check with you in uh, six months, you'd probably have it tucked away back somewhere in your Bible with a stack of other, other things. And what do we do with this? Look at a few questions and... Some advice. Number one, what does the content of your prayers sound like for this new year? 
I'll encourage you to have an exercise in prayer. Start writing some of your prayers out. I have found that as a helpful tool over the years to write my prayers out because it helps me focus my content and what I'm asking God. I think that's what David did here, Psalm 25. We have a psalm, well, what is that? It's, it's an opening into David's journal. It's our opportunity to see what David wrote down as he prayed to God. This was his prayer. Oh Lord, I lift up my soul, I'm coming before you. If I were to look at this, my sanctified imagination is, here is David, he's down on his knees before God, and his very first statement on his knees, he says, oh Lord, I come before you. I'm lifting up my soul without anything. It's a prayer. What does your prayer look like? Better yet, what will your prayer life look like in this year? What's the content going to be? Secondly, hope you answer honestly, do you or do we as a church wait upon the Lord for his direction? Yes or no answer. You can answer that. It's what David was asking. Number three, I will commit myself to praying and requesting Psalm 25, verses 4 through 7. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. I hope that you might take that as a challenge, as Psalm 25, and ask God to do those things in your life. And oh, beloved, I want to tell you, I think if you seriously get down and, and ask God these things in your life, stand back and watch what God's going to do. You'll be amazed at what paths, what ways he's going to lead you on. Number four, whatever paths God leads you on this week, this month, this year, just remember all the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth, wherever he may lead you. Number five, regardless of how bad things may get in your life, may your prayer always be, let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Go back and rehearse Psalm 25, study it out. There is a real theology in Psalm 25, the theology of prayer and all the things that go into it. There is a theology of waiting upon God. If you're looking for some good Bible studies for 2023, I would encourage you, study prayer and or study waiting upon God as you find in Psalm 25. Heavenly Father, as we close, I thank you for the opportunity to open your word and to look at David's life and his prayer. And know how we can learn from this psalm. Oh God, I would ask that you would teach us to pray like this. Like that disciple who asked the Lord, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. So Lord, I'm asking you today that you would teach Community Bible Fellowship. Teach this assembly how to pray. May this be a church filled with mighty prayer warriors. Oh, I pray, God, that this will be a church who knows how to reach heaven, how to move heaven. The church today is looking for more methods, but you are looking for men who are mighty and mighty in prayer. And so, Lord, we're asking that, expecting that in this year, and for that we thank you in Christ's name, amen.